This is the broadcaster at 40 for playback in Americana. The Broadcaster at 40. This week, WTIC celebrates 40 years of broadcasting, and throughout the week we'll be presenting our story, the story of the broadcaster at 40. WTIC was an idea in the summer of 1924 when the late Walter G. Coles, vice president of the Travelers Insurance Company, convinced Lewis F. Butler, then president of the Travelers, that the company should embark into the field of radio broadcasting. Walter Coles was a pioneer, the man who wrote the first insurance policies on an automobile and on an airplane. He was an early enthusiast for the new medium of radio. Hartford was without a broadcasting station in 1924, the year that the travelers applied for a license to operate such a facility. Shortly after deciding to enter the field, the first positions in the station, those of chief engineer and assistant, were filled respectively by the late J. Clayton Randall and the late Herman Taylor. In the fall of 24, the Department of Commerce granted a license for WTIC to operate a 500-watt transmitter on the 860 kilocycle frequency. Two steel towers were erected atop the Travelers Grove Street building. Two major test broadcasts were planned in December 1924, recruiting talent from the ranks of Travelers employees. When February 10, 1925 arrived, new radio studios had been installed on the sixth floor of the Travelers Grove Street building. Dana S. Merriman, formerly supervisor of music in West Hartford Public Schools, was appointed musical director. Ralph L. Baldwin, supervisor of music in Hartford Public Schools, was made consulting musical director. Signing on the station that night, Mr. Cole said, When it was decided the company would undertake the broadcasting service, President Butler's requirement was that we should have a service which in every way would be representative and worthy of the company the name of which it bears. We believe we have met this requirement fully. It was obvious from the outset that the company was not thinking of using the station for commercials of its own, let alone those of outside business houses. Only a few months after the historic opening broadcast, the station was in the national spotlight when it offered an exclusive talk by Colonel William Mitchell by direct wire from Washington. Billy Mitchell was detained for court-martial in connection with the air service controversy of 1925. On this occasion, Colonel Mitchell spoke on behalf of an aviation meet at Hartford's Brainerd Field, but his remarks were colored by forthright criticism of military officialdom for neglecting the development of aviation. <laughs> In those early days, one of the mainstays of broadcasting was the live band. WTIC's broadcasting debut featured the music of Emil Heimberger's trio, direct by a wire from Hartford's Hotel Bond. One week later, on February 17, 1925, the downbeat of Norman Clotier and his orchestra modulated the WTIC airwaves as they performed from Joseph P. Neville's Dancing Academy. Remote broadcasts were popular, too. They came regularly from the Austin Organ Studios, from Foot Guard Hall, the Colts Park Dance Pavilion, from Club Palais Royale, and others. But the Clotier Orchestra was one of the favorites. And one of the most popular Clotier numbers was, I've Got a Feeling You're Fooling.
Ah, that takes you back, doesn't it? The music of Norman Clotier and his orchestra was to be heard throughout the nation. Originating from the Hartford studios of WTIC. We were a network feature. I was a vocalist with them at the mm -hmm. time. I think we were on for about nine years altogether. One of the singers heard with the Clothier band, Fred Wade. And they didn't realize just how popular they were throughout the country. Of course, it was a network show. And we used to have people come in here from the South or the Midwest. or The orchestra is very popular in Canada. And uh, they'd come in, you know, and the first thing they wanted to see, the Merry Madcaps and Norm <laughs> Clothier. And we couldn't figure it out, you know, why we were so popular around here. Of course, you know, no man is a prophet in his own country, so right. they say. And uh, some of the comments would be, uh, we want to see that. You know, in our hometown, when you folks go on the air, he says, everything stops. He says, no one works, no one does anything. They just listen to the Merry Madcaps. He says, you got a wonderful outfit. And we'd look at them, you know, wondering, <laughs> what's, matter with this this one, what's going on here? See? <laughs> but that was uh, the opinion of many people throughout the country. Milestones were passed rapidly. In March of 1925, WTIC joined in the first coast-to-coast -coast broadcast of a presidential inauguration. The man inaugurated was Calvin Coolidge. I believe in the American Constitution. I favor the American system of individual enterprise, and I am opposed to any general extension of government ownership and control. I believe not only in advocating economy and public expenditure, but in its practical application and actual accomplishment. Information and news of world events were in the air. They were joined by the radio drama and the discussion show, plus the live bands and choral groups. A series of health talks began in 1925 and was heard for more than two decades. And live sports broadcasts were heard in southern New England when in the fall of 1925, WTIC joined a network in the play-by-play -play coverage of the Cornell Penn football tilt. The sportscasters, Phillips Carlin and Graham McNamee. Broadcasts involving Connecticut's Institutes of Higher Learning gathered momentum with the installation of lines between the TIC studios in Hartford and the Yale campus in New Haven. Yet throughout this entire period, no advertising was permitted on the air. A unique situation existed. A firm was allowed to present programs under their corporate title, but without commercial announcements. There was no charge to the sponsor for the time. He merely was responsible for talent and production costs. From the stage of the Capitol Theater in Hartford, they all appeared. The greats of American vaudeville. Are you sure this is Rudy Valley's office? Oh, it must be. There's a picture of Rudy Valley looking at a picture of Rudy Valley. Yes. <laughs> Bergen and McCarthy. Phil Baker. Jack Benny and sliding Billy Watson. Introduced in programs emceed by theater manager James Clancy. An enthusiastic showman, Clancy was later to become manager of WTIC. Also appearing from the Capitol Theater was Walter Dawley, who presented regular recitals on the great theater organ. And it was from the Capitol Theater that the great Houdini admitted he was baffled by the mysteries of radio. One man who wasn't at all baffled by the magic of radio or its weight was engineer Al Jackson. I became... Uh after my training period was over, known as the chief remote man. And I did all the remotes uh, along with one of the other engineers. And especially, I can remember on a Thursday evening, it was always a two-man remote job because we had seven remotes, live remotes, in the same evening. And we'd start off uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening with a uh, broadcast of the High Blind Trio over here in the old High Blind Hotel. Mm -hmm. And then one of us would stay there, and the other one would take the truck, go down to the Hotel Bond. We'd broadcast Emil Heimberg in that trio. Then, uh, as soon as that was over, we would pick up those two remotes, and the next thing we would do would be to go over to the, the old Capitol, Lowe's Poli Capitol Theater, and while the picture was going on, we would have to set up in the orchestra pit seven carbon microphones and a mic backstage for Jim Clancy, who did all the... He was the manager of the theater at the time, and he did all the announcing of the vaudeville acts. And we broadcast the whole vaudeville show as soon as the picture was over. And then the picture would come back on after the show, and then we'd have to pull this all down. And if you can imagine crawling around in a pit in the dark, 
with the theater, you know. It wasn't an easy job. And then uh, we would go from there to the Hotel Bond Ballroom, where Emil Hamburger's dance band would then go on the air. While that was on the air, one of us would go back to the Capitol Theater and uh, set up the organ program. We'd have to go up into the organ loft and put a carbon mic in each side of the organ. And this was the sign-off at 12 o'clock midnight for WTIC. We'd have Walter Dolly at the organ, and then we'd sign off. Well, these were the remotes that we would do in one evening, and this is just one evening out of the week. The NBC chimes as they sounded in the early 30s. WTIC was one of the first half dozen of the country's radio stations to affiliate with the National Broadcasting Company Network. Listeners to WTIC on the evening of February 15, 1926, were introduced to NBC through a formal opening broadcast. Featured on that memorable evening were the New York Symphony Orchestra, the Goldman Band, B.A. Rolfe and his orchestra, Tito Rufo, Harold Bauer, Mary Garden, Will Rogers, and Weber and Fields. Remote broadcasts were coming thick and fast in 1927. The world's first public broadcast from a flying aircraft originated on WTIC with Connecticut's flying governor, John H. Trumbull, and aircraft builder Igor Sikorsky conversing from a Sikorsky plane flying over Hartford. Charles A. Lindbergh visited Hartford as his first stop on a cross-country tour following his epic flight across the Atlantic. And the slender young fellow spoke nervously into a WTIC microphone as he prepared to lead the Yale band in his broadcasting debut. His name? Rudy Valley. The engineer in that job later recounted that Rudy wasn't exactly nonchalant about his first broadcast. In fact, Rudy Valley was playing the saxophone, and at least half of his performance was played into the dead side of the mic. Valley was to appear in another important role in the history of WTIC. On the station's fifth anniversary, February 10th, 1930, Rudy Valley and his Connecticut Yankees were featured artists in a special program presented for WTIC by the National Broadcasting Company. A few days ago, I talked with Rudy Valley by phone in New York about some of his recollections of those days. The Fleischner from 32 to 39, we did it for 10 years from 29 to 39, began the five-act variety format in 32 with the Ed Sullivan show of radio. We presented everybody who was anybody. The only person we didn't present was Jack Benny. He was too young. <laughs> but then, of course, I think the most exciting broad radio broadcast I ever did was those in the Seal Test show with John Barrymore because he was such a personality and we had such great... We had a writing staff that you couldn't buy today for... Uh, probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars Ed Gardner before he did Duffy's Tavern was produced and directed the show and supervised the writing and under him was A. Burroughs who worked for three fifty a week A. Gardner got five hundred uh, A. Burroughs did about uh, twenty or thirty shows with us he got three fifty a week and we had Paul Henning who created Hill, Beverly Hillbillies and uh, Petticoat Junction for two fifty we had uh, Jess Oppenheimer who created I Love Lucy we had uh, Paul Frank Galen we had uh, Isaacs Charlie Isaacs we had Panama and Frank, all of these boys for 250. We had the greatest writing staff probably of any show that's ever been done in radio, and uh, our scripts were just fabulous and dire more because they were even convulsively laughter. And the voice of Rudy Valley in those days brought swoons from the ladies as he sang. Flirtation is an art with Betty Coed. Her station quite depends upon her charms. She gets the men in rushes by well-cultivated blushes, and she's happy with a fellow on each arm. Betty Coed has lips of red for Harvard. Betty Coed has eyes of Yale's deep blue. Betty Coed's a golden head for Princeton. Her dress, I guess, is black for all Purdue. Betty Coed's a smile for Pennsylvania. Her heart is Dartmouth's treasure, so to said. Betty Coed is loved by every college boy, but I'm the one who's loved by Betty Coed. 
she made a wreck of Carnegie Tech and all of its engineers. She did the same at old Notre Dame, her line is good for years. Roguish eyes, telling lies, breathing sighs. Betty Coet has lips of red for Cornell. Betty Coet has eyes of navy blue. Betty Coet's a golden head for Amherst. Her dress, I guess, is white for Georgia, too. Betty Coet's a smile for old Northwestern. Her heart is Texas treasure, soldiers said. Betty Coet is loved by every college boy. But I'm the one who's loved by Betty Coed. On the spot reporting of sports activities were regular events in 1928, and fans were anxious for regular reports on their favorite teams. To accommodate this need, A.B. Art McGinley, sports editor of the Hartford Times, was engaged to air a weekly commentary. Speaking of sports, of course, very glad to be back here at my old alma mater, WTIC, where I had the privilege of, and good fortune to be in on this pioneer days. Art McGinley and our own old sport, Bob Steele, recall some of the sports events of that time and some other things. Hey, I remember particularly the night that I had uh, <coughs> Jack Dempsey and Maxie Bear here. And those were the days when the newspaper publishers of the nation had the false phobia that the radio would put the newspaper out of business. And two minutes before I was to go to the air with Maxie Bear and Jack Dempsey, I got word from the newspaper, not to go on, I had to turn them over to an announcer. I remember one thing particularly that night, you know, uh, both Bear and Dempsey are fairly, were fairly big fellows, and they took a young lady here who was singing, I've forgotten her name, she's known as the Melody Maid, and they swung her between them as though she were a rag doll. Got a lot of fun out of it. Then, of course, I had Frankie Fish here, the Fordham Flash. I had uh, John Henry Lewis and Henry Armstrong, both champions of the prize ring, and it was curious that when I asked Armstrong and uh, uh, John Henry Lewis what their plans were for their post-ring days, they both said they wanted to be ministers. Well, John Henry Lewis became a minister, and Henry Armstrong is now in social welfare, missionary work somewhere in a city on the Pacific coast. But I think I really set a record, Bob, the day that I brought John Pepper Martin of the famous St. Louis Cardinals Gas House Gang. Mm -hmm. I brought him direct from Buckley Stadium to the microphone at WTIC in his uniform, which is cake with dirt. There's perspiration rolling down his face, which also had a little bit of the dust of the diamond on it. And he had in his uh, right, I may have been left, I don't know, I'm not very good on right and left. He had, in one side, he had that fav uh, favorite diet of the baseball player doing warfare, a big char of tobacco. And he was priceless. <clears throat> he uh, sang songs, told stories. And uh, I, as far as I know, no one has ever brought a ball player direct from a ball field to a microphone in the full regalia of the game. Now, uh, when, when did you start as a uh, sports announcer here at TIC? Uh, well, it was in the early days. That would be, what, 24? 25, around in there, I imagine. And uh, <laughs> I laughed to laugh when I recalled him because there was only one thing I was never suited for. It was radio. I uh, <clears throat> used to rush over here from the Times at noon during the World Series, and then I used to come on there from, on very special occasions. And, and, of course, I had a regular program here for some time. But in those days, the microphone, believe it or not, uh, 
scared most persons to death. I can remember one of Hartford's leading lawyers and a very brash individual. No one thought anything could ever phase him. He came over here for a dress, just for a dress rehearsal, so to speak, and he was so upset, nervous, and scared of this thing that he went out, I'm loath to report, and took the strong drink. Imagine that. But, uh, I used to... That happens to a lot of people. Yes, I understand. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was old Crow's Man of the Year myself in it's... 1927. I thought that I had to shout, and I can remember, Bob, I used to leave the microphone, and I walked the whole length of this big room, or way to a far corner to get a drink of water, and leave dead air, then I come back and say, as I was saying... To be air, be dead for. They tell me that once upon a time you were interviewing somebody and he got up and he left the studio and you were left all alone and you had to talk for something like 30 or 40 minutes and you kept it going. Uh, that, that you was, recall that? That was on a THT. Oh, that was on another I radio station. Yes, and it's, uh, I know it it's, happened. It's, it's defunct now, so I suppose you can mention it's it. It's all right to mention it. Sure. Here's the way it happened. I was, <clears throat> I was on there for a sports program, and I was just going to the American Industrial Bank, and Jack Waldron, who's MC at the Hollywood Club in New York, came along. He said, where are you going? I told him, he said, I'm only doing 18 minutes to the State Theater. Keep going. I'll come back. So I talked for one hour and ten minutes without a note. All my notes were in the half of national. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I talked about the habits of the early Chinese, the voyage of Columbus, mortality among moths, mm -hmm. Babe Ruth. I'd love to have a platter of it. One hour and ten minutes. Don't you think that's a record, Barry? That, it must be a record, yes. <laughs> Not a good be. one, but it's Without a, a note, it would have to be a record. Bob Steele and Art McGinley and sports broadcasting then and now. The biggest news in southern New England's radio history broke in the fall of 1928. After much experimentation by the technical staff, it was concluded that due to poor ground conductivity in New England, improved service to urban and rural areas could only be obtained through an increase in power. Therefore, the station applied for and was granted approval to increase power to 50,000 watts on a frequency of 1060 kilocycles, with a proviso that the frequency be shared with WBAL Baltimore. While far from the ultimate solution, especially in view of a nearly half-million-dollar investment in transmitter site and facilities, it was hoped that another wavelength would soon be available and the station might be able to broadcast full-time. As 1928 dawned, preparations were well underway for the new facilities. On July 30th, 1929, Vice President Walter Coles, the man who introduced WTIC to the air in 1925, announced over those same airwaves... We believe this conservative course is necessary and that the reason for it will be fully understood and appreciated by our friends of the air. During our experience with the old station, we have accomplished a great many rather remarkable things which might almost be called peace. We have originated and developed entirely new things, later copied by other stations. And in many ways, we have proven our ability to handle a broadcasting station to its extreme limits, rich in the experience which the station has given us, and pledged to a service strictly in the public interest, convenience, and necessity as the law requires. It was August 2nd, 1929, when the station returned to the air with increased power, broadcasting only on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and half of Sunday each week. The other time was used by WBAL. Within the year, the station would be broadcasting with full power, and that full power was heard in homes around the world as cards from Germany, Sweden, Australia, Africa, and many other distant lands revealed. It's How Do You Do from Hartford Town, the studios of WTIC, as the National Broadcasting Company brings you Madcap Variety, presenting the music of Norman Cotier's Merry Madcap assisted by the voices of Durrell Alexander and Brad Reynolds. Madcap Variety. The orchestra takes the curtain cue with Irving Berlin rhythm from Top Hat. Isn't this a lovely day? Between the new power and the growing NBC network, the music of Norman Clotier and the Merry Madcaps was to be heard around the country and around the world as they made merry music from the TIC studios.
Norman Claude here and the staff musicians were not only heard in programs of dance music, they were called on regularly to provide background music for dramas written and produced by the station's first continuity writer. Hired in 1929, he is now vice president and general manager of WTIC, Leonard Patricelli. I was given an old Underwood next to the uh, engineering control room and uh, told to write. And uh, it started with uh, the program manager handing me a list of musical programs for the day. And I would write the copy for the announcers. Or uh, uh, I would write speeches for men who had been invited to speak on the air. Uh, for example, the first uh, speech I ever wrote for radio was for Governor Trumbull. You would give them the basic uh, speech material. They could revise it to their own taste, and then they would deliver it. I would write uh, dramatic works. Uh, the music uh, was, of course, the, the biggest uh, field, and it was many-faceted because it involved not only... Uh, uh, popular music, but string quartets, quintets, vocal works, symphonic works, operatic works. So that I found myself uh, studying when I wasn't writing, and uh, I averaged 16 programs a day. And uh, well, it was never less than never less than 13 or 14, and it would go as high as 20. And you would write all day. And the hours were from 8 till 6, but I never could complete the work until 8 or 9 at night. As the calendar introduced the 30s, such well-known musicians as Moshe Peranoff and Christian Kreans were heard regularly conducting serious works from the station studios. But the device which was to spell the ultimate demise of the live studio orchestra was introduced in 1929. It was the phonograph record, the electrical transcription. 1930 saw the nation slowly attempting to rise above the effects of the devastating market collapse of the previous year. At WTIC, it marked the end of an era. It was in 1930 that the company found it no longer practicable for the travelers to support the station as a medium for publicity. The first rate card was prepared, and the first commercial time was sold. And in April of 1930... A broadcasting pioneer from Chicago took charge of WTIC's destiny. I uh, certainly uh, considered that this uh, new gadget, radio, had tremendous power and appeal. Paul W. Morency had been highly successful as a young Chicago newspaper man, but had recognized the opportunities provided by the then relatively new medium, radio. Today, as president of Broadcast Plaza, Incorporated. Paul W. Morency recalls some of those early days. I was offered the position of field manager for the National Association of Broadcasters, and their offices at that time were in New York. They're in Washington now. And so I came to New York to be manager of field service, which really meant this was a very young organization, just as the industry was young. So I went around the United States and persuaded those who were not members to join the, the organization. Then while I was there, I was offered this job at uh, WTIC. WTIC was not yet five years old when you came here in That's 1929. That's right. Had uh, policies been pretty well established upon which you built? <clears throat> well, I came, uh, no, uh, I would say no, except uh, the general policy under which the Travelers Insurance Company runs, that is to run a quality uh, organization. But when I came here, uh, they didn't accept commercial programs. When I came here, if you furnished a, the program material, they'd give you the time. When I came here, they weren't on the air all the time they could be. They were sharing time, I believe, at that time with, uh, was it WBAL in Baltimore? Yeah, that's right. So we we were on uh, four nights, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, and we were on three days. Uh, but in 1929, when I came here, uh, uh, oddly enough, we'd go on about 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 to 10, and then we'd drop off for two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come back in the afternoon and then sign off at 6 o'clock. So the first thing I did, really, was to 
sign on at 7 a.m. and run straight through to 6 o'clock. More time on the air meant more programs. In 1930, as the impact of the new general manager was being felt, a number of new innovations were introduced to an enthusiastic audience. 10,000 listeners responded to an offer of a cookbook compiled by Flore Bishop Bowering, a home economist who was engaged to present a regular home and kitchen show for the ladies. A series of farm and home forums were instituted in September of the same year, and Mike Hanapi and his Alima Islanders became a popular music series. Moshe Paranoff and musical director Christian Kreans collaborated in many more serious musical efforts. Later in the year, Hank Keene and his Connecticut hillbillies became popular daily favorites throughout southern New England. Local programming filled many hours each day, but more programs were becoming available from the network. Even with us, uh, you see, in the afternoon we had the uh, what they called the soap operas, and that was pretty solid from 1 to 5.30 or so. What we did here uh, with the morning shows, and we instituted in the 30s the early morning show, and, uh, and then uh, one of the basics, which we started here, it's hard to believe, but back in the early days of radio, the uh, newspapers, which owned the Associated Press, you know, that's a mutually owned organization, uh, and the UPI and at the INS, it wasn't, it was United Press and International News Service, which is owned by Hearst. Now, those three services, under the pressure of the newspapers, combined to restrict the use of news on radio because they thought it would hurt the sale of papers. So, <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe now, but they, uh, under the agreement reached by the networks and the news services, they would delay anything that happened two hours. Automatically. Automatically delayed two hours. And then you were only uh, allowed to use the uh, what would amount to a headline. And then you had to agree to say at the end, for further details, read your daily newspaper. <laughs> well, this couldn't endure, you know. So there was a chap named Herbert Moore who founded Trans Radio. And WOR in New York was the first one that bought the service, and I think we were the second. And incidentally, our own news director, Tom Eaton, you know, was their Boston uh, man, Trans Radio Press. So that broke the log jam, really. And the other breakage which had to come was done by uh, Lowell Thomas and a couple of other leading newscasters. What they did then, uh, they set up their own news service by uh, having uh, four or five men who would uh, pick up the news of the day. Then they would get on the telephone and get an interview with uh, whoever was concerned in the news, Washington or San Francisco or whatever. And that's the news that they were using, bypassing uh, the news services. So finally, the news services had to come around. And, and uh, now, of course, they're actively uh, soliciting uh, uh, clients among the radio and television stations. Mr. Morenzi, wasn't it about this time that uh, you began the station's own repertory company of actors and actresses? Yes. Uh, uh, during the early years, uh, uh, for instance, we put on a repertory theater under Guy Hedlund, who regrettably was killed about 10 days ago in California. And under his direction, uh, we developed quite a few players, such as Ed Begley and Mike O'Shea and the rest of them, Gertrude Warner. Well, those all came out of that one uh, little repertory company. It was in uh, terms of money and uh, so on. Uh, you'd speak of it today as a very small thing. But uh, relatively, it was important, and it was very important to those who received training for it. I am so grateful to the, the years and the experience that I got at WTIC. When I finally got up my nerve to crash, to try and crash uh, network radio in New York, uh, I really had uh, quite a jump on some of those boys down there who apparently had had much more experience on the network than I did. But I found that I had had a great, great deal more experience, actual experience than they, because of all the opportunities I got at DIC over those years. 
Yes, Ed Begley was one of the original members of the Guy Headland Playhouse Group. A few days ago, one of the announcers from the Playhouse called Ed at his California home. Uh, we're calling uh, Ed Begley in uh, California. Hello. Hello. Is this Ed Begley? Yes. Well, for heaven's sakes, George Bowen Hartford, how are you? Well, George, I'm very, very happy to be to you. Say, Ed, uh, uh, all of us around here, of course, uh, very recently were, were pretty much saddened by the news of the passing of Guy Hedlund, and I know you must uh, have been, too. It did get in the art of paper, then. Yes. I say. And, uh, of course, uh, most folks know that Guy Hedlund, for many years, directed the WTIC Playhouse on radio, and uh, that you were connected with, with Guy on the Playhouse for a long time. Yes, indeed, I was. In fact, I think that was uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, main plateaus of my... Uh, uh, starting to get what little success I've had, George. Uh-huh. That's an understatement if I ever heard it. When did you start at TIC? Do you recall the date? 1931. See, only the station had been on the air only six years at the time that yes. uh, you joined the group. I had been a member of the Hartford Players, and uh, Jay Ray was the director there. Right. And I went down to audition the Hartford Players. Now, uh, get this, George, I had been a theater manager prior to this. Mm -hmm. Where was this, Ed? in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But I'd come back to Hartford as I had many, many times before, and I heard about this uh, Hartford Little Theater Group, and I went down there, and they uh, they auditioned me. Jay Ray was the director, and I got a part in the first uh, play. And uh, uh, finally, uh, I had heard that uh, Guy Hedlund had come from the West Coast where he had been in silent pictures and been with D.W. Griffith and so forth and so on. He was starting a dramatic stock company at WTIC and had uh, uh, very wisely corralled some of the uh, uh, good professional actors around Hartford, uh, Jay Ray among them and uh, Charlie Richards. And uh, I asked uh, Jay if he would possibly speak to Mr. Hedlund to see if I could get an audition. I was then working at the Wiremold Company in Elmwood, mm -hmm. and Jay said he would speak to him, and he did, and uh, I was invited to come in, and I spent three afternoons, because Mr. Hedlund was kind of forgetful, and each day he would forget to give me a voice test over the <laughs> microphone, because I was losing money, which uh, was sorely needed, but uh, finally, he uh, had me just read cold, not over the microphone, the engineer had been uh, gone, and... Uh, it was that of a young man. He said, your voice is too mature for this, but I just want to hear you read. And when I read it, he said, you've got the part. Uh, there was a young man who had been playing it, but he said, I gave the uh, appearance of youth, the suggestion of youth, uh, better than the young man, uh, even though I was uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, older and, and uh, my voice too mature for the part. You must have been at least 18, Ed, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so uh, that was uh, my my beginning there, and uh, uh, the innumerable uh, opportunities I had on so many programs. In March of 1932, the name of Lindbergh was again in the news. The Lindbergh child had been kidnapped, and the WTIC staff was on duty for approximately 40 hours. When one of the suspects was taken into custody in Hartford, the station was ready with microphones installed in the Hartford County Building and at Brainerd Field. The biggest network thus far, 60 stations, was fed by WTIC, and millions listened to learn if Red Johnson, captured in Hartford, was the man sought in the kidnapping. It was in 1933 that WTIC was again sharing frequency and time with WBAL. Yeah, you know, way back then, 33, I think it was, that I showed up with the rest of the folks. It was Elisha Wright and his sister Jane. She was my cousin, by the way. And we all got together on the Wrightville Daily Clarion. Yep. Yep. Zeke Peck, or better known as Fred Wade. I was the eccentric cousin. <laughs> Could we call him Cousin Zeke just for a few words? Well, I don't know why not, Bill. <laughs> you know, you're one of these new uh, scallywags uh, taking up announcing uh, late, and uh, we're glad to have you. You know, when I came here, uh, Mr. Mullins was the program manager then, and for years, he tried to get me to stop speaking like that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know how, how valuable you were, huh? <laughs> and then Eunice uh, Greenwood, 
uh, played the part of Sister Jane. That's right. This was the trio that was the basis. Uh, then occasionally they would bring in extra actors, Michael O'Shea, and he played the part of Deuteronomy. That's right. Uh, the office, uh, one of the office helpers, and they'd bring in uh, once in a while Ed Begley would play a part. Sort of a Casper yeah. milk toast type. Right. And then he was even, an alderman or a selectman and so on. So yeah, I, just I can't, can't picture Michael and, O'Shea in that role somehow. Well, as uh, a Casper uh, milk toast. And we <laughs> used uh, Louis Nye. Yes. As uh, Professor Schultz who yeah. was madly in love with Sister Jane. Great, great action. <laughs> that was really the romantic right. interest. Yes, that was very good. And uh, then even toward the end there, uh, uh, I managed to chisel in uh, oh, yeah. with Well Fleet Patterson, That's the right. Cape Cod character, remember? And of course, we had Ed Anderson, too, with Bill Dad Porter. Oh, it's yeah. Bill Dad. Yeah. He was very funny. Yeah. And one here's one incident I recall, that, Bill, that always struck me very funny. The rightful clarion worked in Studio C in, in the old uh, <clears throat> quarter, sixth floor of the Traveler's Building. And uh, there was a window... Uh, which was still a uh, glass window. It hadn't been blocked off for sound purposes. And it had a roller shade on it. It was a very large window. And uh, I was the announcer on the program this particular night. And the clarion was done in episodes. You'd do a, do a scene and then break the scene and do a commercial and then pick it up again, you know. So uh, I, we had finished scene one. I did the commercial. And then as I started my line to open scene two, the line read... Uh, as the curtain goes up on scene two, and so help me, that roller shade went right up with a line, automatically, it went bang and rap, 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 rap around the top. It frightened all of us. I'll never forget it. Oh, we had some funny uh, instances and episodes during that. I always remember one, uh, of course, these ideas were lots of time they came very difficult to Paul Lucas, who uh, wrote the script. And uh, we'd be waiting at the last moment. We probably have about a minute before we hit the air, you know. And he's still writing the still last writing page. Script, sure. And so many times I'd have the punch line, uh -huh. and I'd try to find out ahead of time before I get on the air. You just what I was supposed <laughs> to say, give me a chance to read it. And going down the hall, I'd be reading the last page. Well, here, here was a great pastime for Paul, who, uh, as Fred said, wrote the script. He would write this so he could sit across the table from Fred Wade and sit back and enjoy the program himself. He would give big, long speeches to Cousin Zeke Peck, the funniest things you ever heard. Six different characters. Yeah, he'd be doing all kinds of characters. I did a parrot, remember Twinkle <laughs> Toes? You did the Widow Brown, too. Widow Brown. Did, a, did a, uh, this old widow in it, too? And then, of course, when we first started, I was uh, uh, the advertising manager, and I did that in my own voice. You know? He would have Wade talking to himself, and Lucas sits across, <laughs> sitting across the table, in si yeah. silently yeah. roaring, yeah. laughing. You know? And a good many times, he'd write himself out and go home and listen to it and laugh. <laughs> I'd like to hear the Widow Brown, Fred. Do you recall how she's... Well, like? of course, that was quite a difficult part for me, uh, Mr. Hennessy. But uh, if I was uh, around uh, when you first came here, you know, I thought that you might be able to use me on your program. I love your hairdo with it. Well, that's something uh, right straight from Paris. Thank you. <laughs> Whew, wee. Ah, I left all of them packages out in the kitchen, Janie. Well, that's fine, Z, but wouldn't they send them? Oh, I didn't ask them to. Uh, what'd you get for supper tonight? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, a Hubbard squash. That all, for heaven's sake? Oh, my stars, no. I also got four pounds of salt pork. I figured I could roast it up with potatoes and stuff, and it might go good. Four pounds of what did you say? Salt pork. Salt pork. Yeah, I decided I'd get the pork already salted, and then I wouldn't have to throw salt on it while it was roasting. Oh, you idiot. You don't roast salt pork. No? Of course not. <laughs> Very thought of it. Uh, well, no matter. I got ten pounds of hot dogs, too, so it'll be all right. Uh, feeding in an army? No, but hot dogs comes in good any time. Yes, uh, yes, a string of them makes wonderful Christmas decorations. <laughs> Never thought of that. <laughs> You're a fool now, better plug, Dickel. Well, hey, thank you. Back from your shopping trip, I see. Yeah, you like hot dogs, Bill Dad? I love them. Uh, well, how about lamb chops? Lloyd or kidney? Uh, pitch me that one again, will you, matey? Are they Lloyd or kidney chops? The ones with the handles on them? Lloyd. No, too bony. Uh, no matter. Now, uh, what do you think of roast beef? I like it rare. Zeke Peck. Do you mean to say that you bought four pounds of salt pork and land knows what we'll do with it, ten pounds of hot dogs and lamb chops... Six pounds of them. Six pounds of lamb chops cost a fortune. Yeah, they seem scarce, so I thought I'd better get a lot while the getting was good. Oh, my. 
And how much roast beef did you get? Six rib roast, and it's a beauty. Meat pack. My stars. Uh, what'll we do with all that meat? Well, if you ask me, I was pretty smart. Smart? Well, I figured it might be nice if we had a little bit of a choice of meat for supper tonight. Can you see how it worked out? Bill Dad don't like nothing except in roast beef. Oh, my. We'll be in the poorhouse in a month. Fred Wade was also one of the finest singers to appear with the Men of Song, a male glee club organized especially for radio by its conductor, Leonard Patricelli. I was a member of the group called, I believe it was called the Traveler's Chorus. <clears throat> and uh, Christian Kreens was the director of the orchestra and the chorus. And uh, we'd uh, be positioned before the microphone, there would be uh, eight men and eight women. And uh, in those days, uh, they followed the, uh, the theory that uh, women came first. So you place the sopranos and the altos in front of the microphone and then the men in the back, because mm -hmm. otherwise, lady, uh, otherwise you'd have men in, in, uh, just standing in front of uh, ladies. You just can't do that. And uh, the balance must have been horrible. Because here would be uh, sopranos and controllers right on mic. And those old mics, you couldn't hear the basses and the tenors at all. And uh, I decided one day that uh, after experimenting with, with a few of the boys in the glee club, I said, uh, I'm going to form, form my own choir, and I don't like the, the uh, mic setup. So uh, we started and uh, rehearsed and, uh, well, make a long story short, the the uh, mic position and the way I placed the singers around the mic uh, was so uh, different. For the first time we had balance and we had blend that uh, it was no problem at all. They got rid of the other chorus and I took over conducting the choirs. The first group was this mixed chorus called the Modern Symphonic Choir, 16 men and 6 women. And then the second group was the Men of Song, and then I had a quartet, too. song couldn't be heard every day in early 1934. The station was still broadcasting for only approximately half of each week. Mr. Morency, I'm sure you recall the circumstances surrounding the initiation of full-time operations. That was in 1934, and it was done by uh, <clears throat> assigning uh, WTIC to the same frequency as KRLD in, in Dallas, Texas. 
and we use a directional antenna at sundown Dallas time to protect them, and they use uh, protection for our station. So uh, we got full time, Baltimore got full time, and uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas got full time. They, they divide with Baltimore. The final approval did not arrive until late in the day of May 7th. On the morning of May 8th, the station went on the air with its new wavelength, a brand new set of programs, and at last the ability to conduct full-time broadcasting seven days a week. Probably the greatest feat accomplished once the word of approval arrived late that May 7th took place at the station's transmitter in Avon, where the necessary equipment to facilitate the frequency switch was manufactured by WTIC technicians. With such short notice, it had been impossible to obtain factory-made parts. The only other possibility was to make them. The quartz crystal needed to maintain the new frequency was ground to specifications on the site by J. Clayton Randall, the late plant manager. Later, when factory-built equipment was installed, the crystal ground by Randall was sent to the factory for testing. There at the RCA laboratories, the crystal was found to be correct to a degree of three points within a million. The move to full time meant a number of changes. New structural changes were made in the studios, and transcribed music was contracted for, both a direct result of expanded programming services and full time operations. The first ten years, from a quiet beginning in 1925 to a major broadcasting voice, Within the first few years, onward to a position of broadcasting leadership at the change of the decade, the course had been set, and in the record books, WTIC was destined to be recognized throughout the world as a pioneer, as the station to look to for leadership. Tomorrow, during this same time period, We'll be taking an audio visit in the decade 1935-1945. Reminiscences and comments by some of the TIC folks who played major roles in the period, plus some of the most exciting music ever recorded. The second decade of The Broadcaster at 40.